now the program you've been waiting for. Uh, so today's alumni college session, Dwelling in the Anthropocene, Designing a World for Coastal Adaptation, will run for about 70 minutes, maybe longer. Our two speakers will present for about 20 minutes each, and then we'll have 30 minutes for Q&A. We might take more, just depending on your questions. So let's let's get started. It's my honor to introduce Rennie Myers, class of 2015, and Nikhil Anand, class of 1998. Rennie is a federal affairs manager at Orsted, US. She advocates for programs and policies that will expedite a clean energy transition that is sustainable for people and the environment. While working for the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, she managed offshore wind, marine spatial planning, resilient coastal infrastructure, and other maritime policies for the Subcommittee on Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation. Her anthropological research focuses on artificial reef and nature-based infrastructure development and marine environmental history. Nikhil is a professor of anthropology at University of Pennsylvania, whose research focuses on cities, infrastructure, state power, and climate change. He studies the political ecology of coastal cities and their relationships with water. He's currently writing his second book, Urban Sea. The book explores new ways of urban planning in Mumbai's coastal areas affected by the rising seas of climate change. Welcome, I'm gonna turn it over to Rennie and Nikhil. Thank you for being here. Excellent. Thank you everyone for coming. We're really excited to have you here um, and get into it. Uh, my name is Rennie Myers and Nikhil saying hello from his spot over in Philly, um, based out of Washington, DC right now. And we'll be talking through uh, two components of our, our relationships and work with coastal adaptation. We'll talk a little bit about what the Anthropocene is, uh, and then Nikhil will share some of his excellent work uh, in Mumbai. Uh, shortly after that, I'll discuss sort of how I've looked at coastal adaptation through the, my work in the legislative, uh, executive, and now uh, private sectors. Slide, please, unless Nikhil, you have anything you want to say. He's all good. <laughs> um, no, yes. Um, thanks so, so much, uh, Olga and Amy. Delighted to be here and in conversation with Rennie. Um, our, um, we're doing a little bit of a tag team presentation today. I think Renee will start with a bit of an introduction, um, a follow up, and she'll return, return to Renee's work at the end. But more than anything, we're just looking forward to having a great discussion with you all today. So thanks for joining us. You're here. So to give everybody some shared vocabulary for the duration of the presentation, um, we're using this word, the Anthropocene. Now, please do take with a grain of salt, the Anthropocene is not uh, a term that's been uh, validated um, or approved for sort of formal physical science use by any one of the major geologic societies, but it is an incredibly useful term that is going through the process of being validated. Um, uh, the Anthropocene is described as being an epoch where humans can influence geologic processes and where environmental issues are global in scope, source, and solution. Um, that, that human activity is inserting itself into the geological record is one way to think about it. There's a long intellectual history to what the Anthropocene con concept is, but it was popularized in 2000 by atmosphere chemi chemist Paul Crutzen, who eff effectively regarded the influence of human behavior on the Earth's atmosphere in recent centuries as so significant as to constitute a new geological epoch. So whether or not you date that to the beginning of the agricultural re revolution, or industrial revolution, or peaks in radionucleotides, or the dropping of the first atomic bomb. Those are sort of the conversations that are currently uh, at play. And what the Anthropocene concept lets us think about is not only uh, sort of the human influence and impact at the geologic and sort of chemical scale on our atmospheric, geologic, ocean-based systems, but also potentially uh, new strategies in which we have to live, grow, and be responsible for uh, an entirely different scale of, of human engagement and, and involvement in our ecosystems. And ecologies that either adapt or fail to adapt to the new material conditions like temperature and acidity that, acidity that have been uh, exacerbated by these types of human intervention. Um, so, you know, this, this, maybe this period for you might simultaneously incent, inc um, incite a sense of responsibility for environmental degradation and also inspire new tactics for growth in government responsibility, personal engagement, business responsibility, et cetera. Uh, one 
final note on this, and I'll pass it off to Nikhil to talk about how the Anthropocene concept has framed his work in Mumbai. Um, so is that there's a political ecologist, uh, Aletta Bierstack, um, who in conversation with anthropologist Amelia Moore argues that this epoch maybe requires new understandings of collectivity and responsibility, whereby engaging the discourses and processes enabled by this Anthropocene idea um, transforms the, the way that we live and work um, how we produce knowledge about place and space, infrastructural aesthetics, um, and the in this context, environmentally oriented actors hope that de design solutions might simultaneously mitigate ecological impacts and encourage environmental stewardship through the built environment. Um, in my work, this appears as artificial reefs, which I'll talk a little bit about later, but I hand it off to Nikhil to give us some really excellent examples of uh, what the Anthropocene can mean. Thanks, Rene. Um, um, so yes, um, Rene and I had a chance to talk a little bit before this presentation and, um, and to, to, to put it together. And, and I think one of the, the key terms that I think brings many of us uh, together, um, as, as, as she points out, um, is Anthropocene. Um, in, in some ways, um, this is a recognition, I think, that has also been reflected um, in the um, initiation of an environmental studies program at Reed, um, when I was um, a graduate student there, a uh, graduate student, an undergraduate student there um, in the uh, mid '90s, um, you know, the option was to take, and which is what I did, um, some mixture of like the, to fabricate our own major through alternate biology and add-on classes and improvise in a, a program into being to recognize that the social world is. Um, inflected through natural relationships and, and vice versa. Um, the Anthropocene is a recognition uh, that nature culture distinctions are no longer apply. Um, it brings to mind um, David Harvey's work, who a geographer David Harvey's work, who two decades ago would say that there's nothing unnatural about New York City. Um, human habitat, social life, and politics are situated in, built with, and subject to changes in the environment. And conversely, uh, humans don't just respond to hum uh, environmental risks and vulnerabilities. Um, differenti differentiated groups of humans, right, um, also produce these risks in quest to make, occupy, and stabilize dynamic environments. Uh, to think with another geographer, Anil Smith, he would say that there is no such thing, uh, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, would say that there was no such thing as a natural disaster, natural disasters are made. So as, as we think about Anthropocene and cities in the Anthropocene, we recognize um, many threats and risks that these cities um, are known to now face with rising sea levels, um, rising heat, um, rising uh, more intense rainfall, and so on. And what we want to dwell on with you today is to pay attention to how these risks and vulnerabilities continue to be made through projects of urban development, uh, urban planning, and the kinds of adaptation that might be possible to think out of our, our, our current predicaments, right? If we think about our coastal uh, cities as natural, um, we might also need to think about the ways in which um, seas and water bodies are not just natural, but also urban. Um, and so in my work, I'm thinking about the sea as not just nature, but an anthropocene, a sea that is rising, a sea that is warmer, and the sea that is transformed by proximate and distant urban processes. So today I want to dwell um, um, and, uh, in the complex intertidal urban seas and coastal habitats of Mumbai, um, a city that I, I grew up in and continue to work in. And to do this, I will first talk about uh, Inhabited Sea, which is a collaborative transdisciplinary project I've had the chance to work on over the last three years with colleagues in the natural sciences, um, social sciences, across film and citizen science in Mumbai. Um, and the central, the central um, provocation for Inhabited Sea was to ask about the kinds of practices of adaptation that we might notice by starting with what people and non-humans are already doing um, in Mumbai's muddy wetscapes. 
Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll start by showing you a little bit about what this project was trying to do, um, and then I'll spend a few uh, minutes talking about the, the book that um, Amy mentioned a little bit earlier, and maybe a couple of short videos that I did as part of this project book um, effort. Okay, Mumbai uh, is a city that is in many ways in hot water. Sea level rise, increased cyclones and intensified monsoons are bringing to Mumbai an unfamiliar climate. Um, I joke about how Mumbai is now um, one of the, um, kind of a joke, not a joke, right? like one of the cities that frequently populates what I'm calling the endangered cities list, right? Together with Jakarta, New Orleans, Phnom Penh, um, cities that are, uh, whose, whose future is, is, is now an open question with the rising water and storms of climate change. Um, but it is not just climate change. There are also proximate ecological and social processes that are disturbing relationships uh, in the sea. I'm thinking particularly of what are now called garbage tides, which you see in the top right image, and, um, um, and sewage, which, which continue to, to animate the seas around Mumbai. Now, the threats of these disasters then are not just global or climatological, they're also made through historic and ongoing decisions of planning, constructing, and inhabiting the city. And in particular, through the practices and projects of reclamation, um, what I call reclamation, reclamation is you know, more often landfill. Um, this is a long-standing established project in Mumbai lasting over 300 years and responsible for materializing much of the city's urban land. And it continues to this day. Uh, what you see on the left is the construction of a massive coastal road um, that is being um, built on, on landfill um, to make the city um, first dry for the performances of urban life. Now, in Inhabited Sea, we asked, how might we th rethink the city as a wet, muddy terrain, one that is made not just of land, but also of water? And in doing this, we wanted to think with the provocations of landscape architects um, and um, planners, Philip de Kuna and Anuradha Mathur, who in the 2009 book and exhibition Soak urged us to, to reimagine cities of uh, Mumbai as inhabiting an estuary, a, a terrain that is already always and sometimes wet. Um, what you see here um, from their book are, are two images. Um, one, is a, one is an outline of Mumbai, an outline that we oftentimes see in development planning maps. You see here surrounded by the sea. Um, and on the, on, on the right is a, is, is a uh, a lovely illustration of the city in section, right? Um, they take a slice of the city and map the elevations. And you see that much of Mumbai only barely, um, very little of Mumbai only barely emerges from the sea. Much of it is at or below sea level. Um, so, so we want to think about these different ways of reading the city and practices of reading that were not just the practices of landscape architects or planners, but also many others that live in the city. And the process of doing this work then for inhabited sea was quite important. It had um, three uh, central um, provocations from which we all worked. First, we wanted to think about the city in and with the different waters that populate the city. Too often, urban planning is imagined as a dry project, right? one of solidifying and exiling, solidifying land and exiling waters from the city. And, and here we recognize that Mumbai and its monsoon and Mumbai and its position barely above sea level is never completely dry. So what might it might mean to actually think about Mumbai as a wet urban space? Um, second, uh, we wanted to think about the, the city and, 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 and the future of the city from not just the imagination of the designers, planners and architects, but from the ongoing practices of residents that were living in the city, right? What ways of being, what techniques of noticing might we um, recognize as knowledge um, in imagining adaptation and, and the future of adaptation in this city? And finally, we want to think a little bit about transdisciplinary research, or we want to do this with transdisciplinary research project. And here, um, the, 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 the provocation was to like think from, create a question from our conversations and not have conversations after the questions were already defined. And so there was a lot of workshopping and discussion 
but actually it went into framing the, different, the seven different projects that we then came to conduct. The research that emerged was then presented in three seminars. Um, they're all online um, at inhabitedc.org. Um, and all the research projects and processes are also online at the same website. Um, and just for the ease of, of, of presentation, I'll just discuss each of these projects um, via the, the clusters we arranged them in for the seminars. The first two projects were under the banner of Living in Rain. The first, Monsoon in Lalubhai, was a documentary film project conducted by 12 to 14 year olds living in one of Mumbai's resettlement colonies. These are colonies that slum dwellers have moved to. Uh, this colony was built in wetland and is always wet and flooded. And, and here we were focusing on the ways in which uh, the, the, um, the, the group that was working, the media collective camp that was working on these projects was focusing on the ways in which kids that were playing in these neighborhoods recognized, responded and traced um, water in these, in these areas. The second project developed exfoliation as an analytic to understand how residents of different classes dwell in a river floodplain. This was work conducted by the School of Environment and Architecture um, and, and, and the students and faculty there did extensive drawings and oral histories as a way to see how the river floodplain is inhabited by high rises and slums alike actually um, when it rains in the everyday. And exfoliation here is a technique of imagining the futures of inhabiting the city, much like a forest and forest exfoliation, right? The peeling away of layers of, of built form, of, of family relationships that are necessary for people to continue to live in this floodplain. Uh, the second cluster of projects, which we um, titled under the banner of Seeing the City, um, focused on the ways in which um, we might think about urban processes once we disassemble um, the, the, the separations of land and sea and coastline. How might the city appear in and from the work that is ongoing in the sea? The first film, a documentary film project made by um, um, Lalita Kamath and Gopal Dubey at the Tata Institute for Social Sciences, um, focused on the ways in which indigenous fishers negotiate the commons in land, on land and in the sea, and paid attention to these histories of dispossession through which their commons, both on land and in sea, have been expropriated over the last um, 70 or 80 years. Um, my project, Urban Sea, I'll talk about in a minute, so I won't say too much more about that here. But the, the last project in this, in this panel, Drawing on Wetness, was done by a, uh, a designer, Ria Shah, and there are these beautiful illustrations of how fishers and flamingos navigate the tides and salinity um, as they are, and sea color, as they are actually trying to practice their livelihoods and their living in Mumbai's mudflats um, on the Eastern coast and in the seas on the West. And finally, the last uh, collection of papers uh, intertitled Plasticity attended to the not so surprising presence of plastics and all kinds of coastal debris uh, in and around Mumbai's shorelines, and the surprising presence of tremendous amount of biodiversity in Mumbai's polluted uh, intertidal regions, right? Um, Mumbai's um, intertidal regions have over 200 to 300 species of different kinds of um, animal life, um, not kinds of plants, and here I'm thinking of, um, of, of not just of jellyfish and fish, but also of of lobsters, crabs, nadarians, coral, um, and many other kinds of life that, that occupy Mumbai's uh, intertidal regions, despite and with the presence both of humans and their debris. And so the, the you know the play on plasticity here was not just thinking of, of the plasticity of non-human life, but also the plastics that continue and now form the habitat upon which these, these residents now, non-human residents now live. Um, so that, that project was the second project on plastics. The first project on plastics was done by chemical oceanographer here at Haverford College, together with a group of a bicontinental team, actually. Um, and the second project was done by citizen scientists of marine life of Mumbai. Okay, so let me just delve in a little bit more um, to the, the project I mentioned that, I, uh, um, that I'm doing now called Urban Sea. Um, in this project, I work with scientists, fishers, and planners 
um, who are all working and living in Mumbai to understand and recognize and in some ways curate the ways in which they're reading the changes in Mumbai's urban coastlines. Um, now here I want to emphasize it's not just that fishers and planners and scientists have different perspectives about what is going on in the city that coming together um, and sitting across a table might in some ways resolve the problems that are presented by um, urban climates and the future of climate change in the city. Um, if only it were that easy. Um, fishers, scientists, um, and uh, planners are not just um, have different craft, but their tools actually allow them to apprehend and see different things that are going on in Mumbai's intertidal regions. And so here I was involved in like trying to document and understand the ways in which Mumbai's urban seas were being, were being um, read um, and the practices of reading that then allowed them to live and practice their livelihoods uh, in and around this, this very confusing and very um, turbid um, water. So here I want to just um, show you two videos um, that stage this tension where planners and um, Mumbai's development officials see in the sea the possibility and potential for land and for fishers who see in the sea a dynamic livelihood which needs to be, um, which needs to be um, practiced into being through delicate ways of noticing fish and fisheries in the sea. Um, so I'm going to show you two films. The, the first film will learn more on the work of Mumbai's coastal planners and urban development officials. And the second um, will focus more on the arts of noticing that make a fishery possible uh, to be fished in in Mumbai's urban seas. So give me a minute while I change, um, change the, the, the stuff you'll be looking at. Massive urban infrastructure projects are now Massive urban infrastructure projects are now being staged in the sea. The Trans Harbour Sea Link, the New Mumbai Airport, and the Coastal Road Project, all currently under construction, are predicated on the colonization of seas and wetlands in the Mumbai metropolitan region. Take for example Mumbai's most audacious project now under construction, the Coastal Road. The nearly 30 kilometer long road will be built over 90 hectares of landfill, costing over 20,000 crore rupees or 3 billion US dollars. In so making the road, the city is realizing a plan that had been shelved for over 50 years. And in many ways, this is a project that is out of its time. As cities around the world seek to respond to climate change by making carbon mitigation and climate adaptation plans, the Coastal Road is an out-of-date project that seeks to do precisely the opposite. It subsidizes and supports fossil-fueled private transit, a transit system that is being built in the sea. There are many other problems with the road. For instance, Project documents warn that it will destroy mangrove habitat, a critical natural infrastructure that protects the sea during extreme weather events, cloudbursts, high tides, flooding, etc. The environmental impact assessment for the project even identifies the prior reclamations as exacerbating the floods in Mumbai in 2005. By destroying natural flood infrastructures, it follows, this infrastructure promises to create more natural disasters in Mumbai's future. Much of this has been written about elsewhere. But here, I want to make a simpler point. That the makers of the road are colonizing the worlds of fissures and ecologies that are native to the city in the sea. The road is being built on the intertidal regions that thousands of coli fishers work to live, providing the city with fish. <laughs> 
It is built on a fragile intertidal ecology, which includes the fish breeding grounds, corals and dolphins, many of which I did not know about while I lived in the city. It is no accident, through no act of oversight, that Mumbai's fishers, their fishing commons and histories were overlooked in the permitting process, and that the consent was not taken prior to the commencement of works in the intertidal zone. It is also no accident that the city did not commission a single ecological study of the region or a livelihood survey of the areas they proposed to reclaim. Here, the city was simply continuing its history of colonizing the sea, colonizing it as it had for over 200 years. Mumbai has been built on reclamation, the project's documents state. This is merely a continuation of that process. This is colonization in the classic sense, in that extant life worlds of fishers, commons and fishing grounds, extant ecologies of zoanthids and crabs and coral and lobsters are made invisible so that the sea can be occupied and improved with labor and rubble. The willful ignorance that is necessary to claim the sea is empty is not stupidity. It is not a lack of knowledge. Willful ignorance is long an established strategy of rule. City politicians and planners need not to know of the lives and ecologies of the sea. Because it is only by ignoring extant occupations of life in intertidal regions, of ignoring the destruction, that the city can tell a grand story of infrastructure construction, of empty waters being filled with world-class development. Aqua Nullius Living in both land and sea, Koli fishers live in over 15 fishing villages, or Koliwaras, in the heart of Mumbai. To become fisher and to produce a sea that reveals fish, Kolis have, over the years, sutured heavenly temporalities with more earthly ones so as to produce a fishery in the urban sea. Fishing season extends from late August into early June. It begins on Naryal Purnima, celebrated on the first full moon of the month of Shravan in the Hindu calendar. This is generally late August. That fishing begins on the first full moon day is not incidental. The tides are strongest on the days of the full and new moon every month, when the most bountiful catches are caught. Accordingly, through the year, fishing labour is focused on the days preceding and following the full and new moon. While the moon advises fishers to narrow fishing times to conducive times of month, the sun advises them of when, on a given day, they may be most likely to catch fish. Fish, my friends tell me, move to and from shallower waters at dawn and dusk, so fishers rise before the sun to catch the fish that rise with it. If nets aren't cast before dawn, or just before dusk, they would complain that they missed the window for a good catch. Taken together, fishing times are ordered by attending to the relations and positions of the sun and the moon and the earth as they orbit and rotate around each other through the days, months and years. Decisions to fish are also socially embedded. Anxious for a good catch, fishers regularly go out during the first spring, spring tides of every fishing season. But as the season wears on, the decision of whether to go out fishing on the edges of this period is socially decided, based on whether and where others have caught fish the previous day. This, together with the colour of the water and the wind speed, inform the decision of when to fish. The practice of casting nets and deciding precisely where to fish is also socially negotiated. The different fishing villages each establish their contiguous fishing areas. Within this area, fishers from the same village actively negotiate distances from other nets that are already in the sea, trying to keep both some distance and yet be close enough to create a cascade of nets across which fish cannot cross. Here too, nets and dynamic relation not just with others claiming fisheries, but also the winds and the tides. <laughs>
For instance, fishers attend closely to the currents and the winds to make the work of fishing more expedient. So when they cast nets at sea, they point their boats in the direction of the tide, so that it quickly opens their nets and carries it behind them. And when pulling up their nets, they do so accounting for the direction of the wind, towards ensuring that the nets do not get pushed under the boat while they do so. Taken together, fishers in the urban sea suture various temporalities of celestial bodies, social relations and urban space to do their work. That is to say, following Barad, fishers do not fish on the sea, but in it. So I'll pause here with, with the provocation to ask what might it mean to think about urban planning uh, in the city as opposed to thinking of the city as a surface. Um, I suggest that fisher practice as a reading time and space, a reading wetness, might hold valuable lessons for urban planning and climate policy that are not modern, of how to read mixes of water, air, and earth as dynamic and not fixed um, in their relationships with each other. It's a sensibility that in many ways um, pushes against our modern understandings of urban space and the space of, um, of human settlements, to see cities and, uh, and habitats as not sitting on social natures, but emerged uh, enmeshed firmly in these relationships and subordinated knowledge. How might policy design amplify these kinds of transdisciplinary knowing and understanding? For that, I turn things over to Renny. Thank you, Nikhil. Um, one, wonderfully done, and, and there's a fitting transition here because and I, I worry that by comparison, talking about policy is incredibly dry. Uh, to your point, the legibility of these of different ocean uses and lifestyles and ways of living with water is part of what determines what types of policies are made or prioritized. So um, not to be as reductive to say it's a matter of who can pay a lobbyist, but rather that um, how these issues are communicated and what different tools are available within the sort of government or private sector toolkit uh, to think about adaptation and what's prioritized within those contexts very much participates in the same veins of a sort of colonization and exploitation through design. Design being a tool that is um, by definition material um, and allows you to uh, reduce the inputs that you have in any particular way. So I'll be talking about three different ways that the coast is acted upon by the government. And I'll bring us stateside by actually referring to um, the testimony from soon to be most likely confirmed National Oceanographic and Atmospheric uh, Administrator Rick Spinrad. So he's from the, our lovely state of Oregon. He recently uh, was teaching at Oregon State University. And in his testimony, he talks about uh, the urban ocean and the urban ocean as a lens through which uh, we should be thinking about not just research and the cultivation of knowledge in these deeply um, enmeshed uh, ecologies and economies, but also um, talking about them as places where we can use apply knowledge and, and mitigate impacts and harms on both marine life and marine peoples. In his testimony, he also happens to call out the uh, estuaries and bays of some very powerful senators and Congress people. So it was convenient for him. Um, so I will, the, the way that I can, I decided to talk about this is through my own experience in the legislative, private and executive you know, branches or sectors. And there are different approaches to resilient or adaptive design. Um, all of which are responding to global, long run, interconnected, uncertain and potentially irre irreversible threats um, but each with a different stake and different stakeholders. Um, Sterner et al. have a, sort of tried to think about what anthropocenic policy might look like in a world where um, there is at the very least human intervention at the geologic scale, at what point does policy um, fit within, does, does policy become a way of managing uh, the coastal zone and our uh, means of engaging and becoming responsible for the impacts that have been made um, either hundreds of years ago to yesterday. Um, not just forcing bad actors to internalize their costs through uh, various forms of regulation, but also remaking policy through the future we want. And that is the sort of policy framing that's been promoted in platforms like the Green New Deal, which is a resolution trying to not have its own specific list of policy opportunities, but rather provide 
a framing through which Congress can move past neoliberal uh, and market driven measures um, for environmental regulation and instead towards future leaning investment. Um, I'll talk a lot about how there are many policy platforms and proposals on the table right now in the sort of two years of opportunity that the, both the House and Senate Democrats have to advance uh, certain types of environmental, climate, or energy policy, um, and how uh, sort of that framing may or has, has both made great strides in the way that we advance policy and also has been uh, not wholly received. So, Nikhil, if you could go to the next slide, please. And one way that I wanted to help people think about and visualize these different um, government modes or private sector modes of engaging with the environment is through my own research. So I am a baby anthropologist, unlike Nikhil, I don't have my PhD. Um, but I, when I was a student at, at Reed and working with an anthropologist, Amelia Moore, thanks to a grant from the school, I started to work on coral restoration as a means by which uh, conservationists, but also developers, either express their anxiety about climate change by these interventions in the coastal zone where they might build a set of reefs in collaboration with the Nature, nature Conservancy as developers to mitigate some of the impacts of their development, but then the conservationists themselves also are taking care of caring for coral. Um, and this was sort of began to get expanded in a Watson Fellowship after I graduated in 2015, looking at a bunch of different sectors and how they engage with uh, artificial reef development as a manifestation of climate anxiety. And so on the bottom left, you'll see, uh, hope, hopefully it's not too small, uh, an image that I took in the uh, Gulf of Thailand where some tools and boulder coral rest on these huge uh, squares that these cubes um, that were dropped off by the Thai government and then um, mostly European tourists would come and uh, both metaphorically and literally colonize these cubes with coral specimen, um, either as a way of expressing their own climate anxiety and doing something about it or mitigating the carbon impacts of the trip that they just took to Thailand to do this work. Um, above that, uh, in sort of the eerie uh, sort of submarine image there, that's actually a, re a rig, an abandoned oil rig off the coast of Brunei Darussalam, which is on the island of Saba, uh, Malaysian, mostly Malaysian island, Indonesian as well. Uh, and the Rigs Reef program, Brunei has a unique relationship with oil and gas in that it's pretty much the sole source of its GDP. Um, so they have a lot of oil rigs off the coast. But we also have uh, rigs to reef that have been supported by federal subsidies here in the United States in the Gulf of Mexico, as well as on, along the Californian coast. Um, and it's been an area of sort of unique uh, allyship between conservationists, fishermen, and uh, oil entrepreneurs to try to preserve these uh, subwater rigs or below the surface uh, vestigial pieces of oil infrastructure because they become at the very least accumulators and habitats for uh, marine life. Uh, to the right, then, you'll also see, this is also from the Gulf of Thailand in the same uh, brief project, but it's referring to work by an artist, Jason DeCares Taylor, who builds, um, on behalf of large tourism developers, these huge underwater sculpture museums that contain uh, sculptures with themes that are meant to provoke anxiety about the Anthropocene and talk about the embeddedness of human life. Uh, in our environments and vice versa. So you'll see in this sculpture here, these coral polyps structures actually have the faces of uh, some of the tourist volunteers who came to Thailand to do some of this restoration work. Jason DeCares Taylor's biggest installation is off of the Canary Islands Lanzarote, uh, which is, was subsidized by their uh, tourism bureau. And finally, uh, I currently work for an offshore wind developer, and I've been excited to be able to apply my anthropology research in the private sector. Strangely enough, I've been surprised um, where the uh, the monopiles, so the large poles that are sticking into the earth and the uh, rubble and rock that we place around them have lots of opportunities and ways that we can redesign these structures to provide a habitat for all sorts of marine life. And I can send this image along around later. It's by a, in an article by Carrie et al, uh, illustrating the different uh, eco zones basically along the transect of the turbine uh, and sort of the opportunities there to improve biodiversity through the installation of these projects. Um, even as we today go through all of the environmental impact assessments of what inst installing that work might actually also enact as well. Next slide, please. Great. So um, my first experience out of grad school with ocean policy was working for the subcommittee on Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation, 
uh, on the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, uh, which is currently chaired by Chairman DeFazio of Oregon. Uh, and he just released his surface transportation reauthorization today or yesterday um, as they try to come to reconciliation with the proposals coming out of the Senate um, and advance certain types of, of uh, ocean policy. And so while I was on the subcommittee and before we got to the surface transportation reauthorization, the ways that we thought about coastal adaptation, because it was very much an industry focused subcommittee, um, were by enabling sustainable freight, by trying to encourage the shift, a shift from uh, truck transport on our crowded highways to maritime highways or marine highways that are supported by the Maritime Administration. Um, we tried to enhance the decarbonization of ports and shipping through types of grants and loans, lots of carrots, not so many sticks. Um, in uh, preparing ports for coastal change, which is still sort of very much an area where we are underdeveloped and underprepared to uh, respond to natural hazards and extreme events. Uh, ports are very often and intermodal areas are where we find emergency response during hurricanes and other large storms and tsunamis and those sorts of events because they're large staging areas where helicopters and other emergency supplies can be uh, staged. Um, and so how we prepare those ports for coastal state change so they themselves are resilient and they can become hubs for different types of um, community adaptation in the long term is an area that I think is underdeveloped. I worked on offshore wind, so how we respond to this nascent massive industry that's going to reshape you know, the coastal waterways and reshape the resource needs in our coastal zone as we build up all this port infrastructure to try to build out our uh, offshore wind turbine farms. Um, we also have to think about the vulnerability and resilience of that infrastructure. So how can we also enhance environmental justice principles by mitigating brownfields or, uh, to, as we try to build out some of the support infrastructure that we'll need for that industry. We also worked on adapting the US Coast Guard facilities. They have a massive amount of coastal infrastructure uh, right on the water. And so um, oftentimes, as I'm sure many know, um, we use defense rhetoric and defense logic to try to leverage additional assets uh, and ensure that we're taking the right steps when it comes to climate mitigation. And the Coast Guard is one area where that vulnerability is, is rather explicit. Uh, Nikhil, next slide, please. Um, so this got a little, for, formatting is a little off here, but I wanted to just share, I, I wasn't sure who was going to be on, on this call. So um, built infrastructure has certainly become a lens for climate policy, right? It, it's a concrete means, pun intended, um, to control emissions, as well as think about what the impact of human life and human activity is on the local environment. Um, but I wouldn't always necessarily, I think to, to call built infrastructure a lens for Anthropocene policy, we need to think about the, the broader impacts on biodiversity and water quality and wildfires, not necessarily just a direct pipeline to climate, but the uh, downstream impacts of climate on the uh, non-built, unbuilt environment, as it were. Um, and so Congress can kind of get at this through a couple different policy vehicles. Uh, there's the Water Resources Development Act. Um, we'll talk about the Army Corps in just a minute, but uh, it's the primary authorizing legislation for the Army Corps uh, and passes every two years. It's, there, there are vehicles that pass every two years that provide the illusion of certainty for uh, congressional members and staff. Um, the Water WARDA, as it's referred to, authorizes both the programs within the Army Corps as well as uh, earmarks and appropriations. Um, for uh, in alternating years. There's the surface transportation reauthorization, which we're going through right now and has become the, um, it's, quite, it's the subject of focus for um, many policymakers, including President Biden. There are the Coast Guard and Maritime Administration reauthorizations, and those are both specifically tied to uh, those agencies, but they also have to be negotiated in, in response to the National Defense Authorization Act. So because uh, a lot of our maritime infrastructure is, um, built and designed in, in parallel with our military industrial infrastructure, right? The Coast Guard, because it's not a part of the DOD, but it is a military branch that focuses on Homeland Security and the Maritime Administration, because fundamentally we subsidize our maritime industry in the United States by providing the merchant marine with additional capital to be able to operate a commercial fleet. Um, and finally, some of the more sort of nature-based solutions here, the Ocean-Based Climate Solutions Act, which uh, passed out of the 
house, I believe, last year and is up for markup again coming quite soon. As a natural resources committee, it's the way of sort of stretching its jurisdiction as far as it can to say that, you know, the ocean isn't just where we make uh, monuments and sanctuaries for ocean species, but it's also what we eat. It's what we, we move on uh, and it facilitates, you know, the atmosphere as we know it. Next slide, please. Um, so on the last slide, I was sort of talking about the ways that uh, the legislative branch thinks, thinks about the ocean environment and interprets ocean issues through the vehicles and lenses that it has available to it. Um, the Ocean-Based Climate Solutions Act, for example, is a new bill that I think has brought, brought a lot of consensus and sort of has expanded the coalition of people invested in, in ocean and adaptation issues. Um, in the executive branch, as I'm, many on the call, I'm sure work in the executive branch, um, their subject matter expertise. So I previously worked at the National Science Foundation in the Division of Ocean Science, um, where we're conducting fundamental ocean climate science. Um, to, the US is one of, as a, as a nation state, is sort of one of the greatest proprietors of its own public data. Many other nations don't have access or public data to the degree or extent that we do here. Um, and so it's meant to sort of create the sort of public access dialogue. Um, and provide an urban ocean lens, to provide an urban ocean lens on that work is the prerogative of someone like an administrator, like soon to be administrator Spinrad. Um, so there's that activity where it's about fundamental hypothesis driven science research. Uh, NSF has been stretching itself as one example of how applied issues in coastal adaptation are manifesting within a federal agenda um, to move towards a more trans and interdisciplinary solicitation structure. So uh, NSF puts out solicitation where it's basically a call for anyone who has a research question that they've been mulling on to apply for that funding. Um, usually the division of ocean sciences, it's a, you've got marine geochemistry and biological oceanography and chemical oceanography and physical oceanography. And if I left out physical oceanography, they'd be very upset um, uh, to, drive forward fundamental knowledge and principles about the ocean ecosystem and physical space. But now programs like the Coastlands and People program are funding hubs where they're pulling together expertise across institutions to try to address a broad suite of questions with at, which at its core has broadening participation in, in science and science research um, in, embedded into the types of research that they're doing at the National Science Foundation. They also have these things called convergence accelerators where they're trying to track both sort of technological investments in themes like the blue economy, so uh, ocean observation and maritime activity, et cetera, with other types of you know, basic ocean science and merge those two items together to accelerate uh, technology transfer, for example. Another uh, executive branch item or way of thinking about or looking at coastal adaptation is that the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy Subcommittee on Ocean Science and Technology Policy or OSTP SOST um, is hosting a resilience workshop in June. And what this is effectively meant to do uh, is to pull together a diversity of actors uh, in across the federal government, it's feds only, and they're trying to get just get everybody even slightly on the same page. Um, this is because every agency has its own culture, every agency has its own set of missions uh, and, and authorizations, what they're allowed to do. Every agency has its own relationship to how they approach their authorizations. So for example, an agency like NOAA um, doesn't like to do things unless they're authorized to do it, whereas an agency like NSF has, takes onto itself the responsibility to say, you know what, this is, we see this need in the research community, we're going to draft a solicitation that faces and meets that need. Um, the question there then is how do you have conversations about adaptation planning and resilience within the federal government if you're, by definition, if it's a federal only conference, excluding local adaptation planners who are the people who are on the ground and engaging with the types of ways of being and phenomenology that Nikhil is describing. Um, finally, the way that the White House budgets and makes investments, you know, how much they decide to plus up certain types of accounts every year in offshore wind or types of adaptation science indicates and signals their needs and preferences to Congress, who has the purse. Um, and they can shift a lot of money around in their, um, in their budgets within agencies. And so groups like the Department of Energy focusing much on, so much on, on their research and development um, can start to leverage offices like the Water Power Technology Office, which ostensibly works on uh, dams and 
hydrokinetic energy, whether or not that's dams or you know wave powered turbines. Um, but that group also does technical assistance for Caribbean nation states to provide to help provide adaptation services outside the country as well. And then there's the Army Corps, which when we're talking about coastal adaptation is really at the core of, sorry, uh, at, at the heart of uh, both conflict and potential adaptation solutions. So next slide, please. Um, just to, to make sure that we stay on time, I'll, I'll go through this quickly. So, you know, you're looking at two different uh, graphics from the Army Corps. The building strong um, sort of language is all about hard infrastructure in response and defense to natural hazards that maintain our national security, maintain our way of living in the status quo, maintain capital market access, that sort of thing. Within the Army Corps now, there's been a, there's a new program developed by their research, research corps, effectively called the Engineering with Nature Group. And what they're trying to do, we've got two examples here. I believe the northern, the, the top image is from Florida. That's a series, that line you see parallel to the coast is a series of oyster reefs that are providing shore stabilization, as well as uh, you know, habitat uh, for benthic feeders and fish. Um, and water filtration services. And then the bottom is, I believe, ooh, in either Mississippi or Louisiana, it's called Deer Island. And that's also another short stabilization feature where they're using materials that have been dredged through other Army Corps projects. So trying to maintain open navigation channels to provide positive benefit um, and beneficial reuse. And they've sprayed that um, in, some, in some cases contam contaminated sediment, which is one of the great challenges of beneficial use. Um, uh, along the coastline to try to mitigate coastal erosion. And so the, the reasons why they're doing this and where they're doing this is incredibly place specific. Sometimes the Army Corps is attempting to ensure the protection of assets, whether or not they're commercial, so a tourism industry um, or a defense asset. Uh, but it's been comforting to see through acts like the Water Resources Development Act that the, um, the Corps is very much taking the message from Congress to heart that they are uh, encouraged to change their benefit of co cost analysis for the types of approach that they take to doing this type of concert restoration work um, to ensure that it really considers environmental co-benefits and also carbon mitigation potential, sequestration potential, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, finally, I'm, I just joined the private sector three weeks ago, so I really shouldn't have too much to say here. Um, but that there, there are other initiatives, both federal between the national flood insurance um, policies and the different types of climate finance that are reconsidering their investment in the coastal zone um, to co corporate social responsibility through nature-based mitigation and vulnerability modeling that they do for their own benefit and their own, own information for their own knowledge to ensure that they're making investments in the appropriate places um, towards, you know, if I don't know if Raphael, who Sanders is here. I don't think she is. She's a fellow environmental studies student from my, my cohort. Um, but she's been working on partnerships with tribal nations to install types of uh, solar infrastructure, also partnering with tribal nations to ensure that ways of life and coastal access are, are preserved and maintained. Um, offshore wind field that, and industry that I currently work in, we are fundamentally <laughs> driven by things like the Coastal Zone Management Act and be making sure that we are aligned with the community principles that are established by state and federal law. Um, and so in, in the context of the federal government trying to support a blue economy, um, when we in, but also and, and create new opportunities within that economy in a changing coastline and changing, changing ecosystem that has already, already been fundamentally altered by um, commercial activity, for me, it just brings up questions as to, you know, how can you do these, do any sort of private sector activity responsibly? Um, and how do you ensure that you are being even more responsive to the people deemed eligible to the state? Um, and so at Orsted, what we, one step that we take uh, is that we have extensive community engagement and stakeholder engagement. And, and we really pride ourselves on making sure that we are present in communities and, and for disclosure reasons, I won't get into uh, too many other details than that. Next slide, please. Um, so that's, that's the gist of it for, for me. I really would love to vision and dream about uh, ways that design, either policy design, infrastructure design, uh, both shape and respond to climate uh, vulnerability. Uh, I think Nikhil also has some other 
questions and food for thought, but are really looking forward to uh, starting a dialogue with uh, some fellow readies. Thank you so much, Nikhil and Rennie. Um, so uh, we have a question, um, but I wanna also encourage everybody start putting some more questions in the chat bar. Um, uh, we we actually have a pretty good amount of time and um, I th there's just so many different uh, things we can explore here talking with Nikhil and Rennie. So Eric Pasetsky, uh, class of 1988, says uh, different coastal cities seem to handle waterfront differently. Seattle has its streets run through lakes and you can't park your houseboat on the street. How do we provide for safety and preservation of native engagement like fishing? Mangrove is very important in preventing storm damage in Southern Florida. Um, I can go ahead, do you wanna go, go first? No, go for it. Oh, I can, I can start and then maybe you can, um, yeah, um, that's a good question and I think I think one of the things and one of the reasons I was talking so specifically from Mumbai is um, exactly for the reasons that um, Eric is describing, right? That there is a knowledge of how cities might be vis-a-vis um, um, -vis their waterways and their waters is situated, right? And this is in some ways a challenge for, for policy and policy design that Rennie is, was talking about. And, and working with as well. And, and the question then becomes, what are the ways in which these um, situated knowledges and practices might be um, both engaged and supported when thinking about um, urban adaptation or urban mitigation projects in different places? Now, this is fundamentally a challenge for policy, which of course is, is more centralized than that. Um, that said, I, mean, I think there are family resemblances for how water is treated um, in and across uh, different cities. And you know, the point I was making with the idea of like water being colonized is a form of urban habitation that is shared across different forms uh, of the world in which wetlands, riverways, waterways, seas are seen to be the backdrop for the staging of dry urban life, right? And so we need to think about ways in which that fundamental value, which is shared across cultures and times and places, um, needs to be rethought and reworked um, when we're thinking about cities uh, in the future. And I'll, I'll point to if anyone's sort of interested in a nonprofit framework that I think does this pretty, pretty well is the Waterfront Alliance in New York City. Um, I really admire their work. Effectively, what they're doing is they're bringing together maritime stakeholders, um, any, any coastal waterfront user, whether, whether it's as, as a New Yorker, you see folks on the docks fishing in the Hudson, which I, as a marine biologist, wouldn't necessarily recommend, um, but getting a diversity of, of stakeholders involved in coastal land use planning. And so um, the way that I think, Eric, to your point that sort of providing for safety and preservation of native engagement, like fishing, happens at multiple scales at the same time, whether or not uh, it's about advocating for specific types of land use policy within your city, if you're noticing that there is something that is exclusively and explicitly going wrong um, or a harm or inequity that, that is being perpetuated by land use um, or misuse, um, through to things like the Coastal Zone Management Act, which requires federal consistency for federal action and planning. So that includes um, the money that the DOT distributes to your city for metropolitan and highway planning. Um, with state regulation and law and state expressed intent. Um, I'm, I'm sure that there are components of the CZMA that also address tribal authority, but I don't know them off the top of my head. Um, so I think this you're sort of asking this question about as we try to predict the change that is coming and take and take action against that change to either preserve ways of life or accept that change and relocate, right? We, neither Nikhil or I talked about managed retreat, which is sort of the hottest topic, I think, in um, coastal, coastal management right now, sort of whether, what, who will have the, the, the sort of the audacity to talk about relocating after disaster or before disaster to mitigate loss either of human life or property or of less importance financial value. Um, yeah, I think there, there's, in, in those spaces, it's, it, it's a matter of value judgment. It's a matter of whose voices and whose practices are being considered most important in the room. Thank you. 
Uh, so Jim Jackson has a comment. Uh, as a geologist, I have some problems with the term Anthropocene, especially as applied to the idea of geological epochs. Uh, paleontologists divide epochs into ages, so perhaps the proposed Anthropocene is better thought of as an age. However, an mm -hmm. epoch or age will have, an, have new species and the Anthropocene does not. So I prefer to think of the Anthropocene as an extinction event. Mm -hmm. These are discrete, short-lived, and open a range of new habitats. Extinction is a bit more intuitive than epoch. Nikhil, or any, I, any thoughts on that statement? I, I, I concur. And I frankly think that the Anthropocene is the most productive straw man that I've seen in anthropology in a long time. Um, it's, it's <laughs> you know, it, it, it is effectively being used as a rhetorical device, as a metaphorical device um, to provoke exactly those types of questions and discussions. Um, and as a, and it, at the very least, it doesn't come with the feeling of like mortal dread that extinction does. Um, so, so maybe people are just uh, protecting their own sense of mortality by calling it an epoch and not an extinction event. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that the one testimony to how, how tricky it is, it's a, in many ways, it's a testimony to the ways that scientists and sort of the, the way that we think about knowledge production within the science community and valid, credi credible um, definitions of periods of time is, is, a, is either a social construct, if you want to see it as a co social construct, construct or a scientific knowledge making process and trying to reconcile those two things, I think has been part of why it's taken so long for the idea of the Anthropocene to be even considered within, I think it's the IGU, the International Geo, Geo Scientist or Geologist Union, but you'll know better than me, Jim. Yeah, I agree. And for the longest time, I'd be very impatient with the term Anthropocene um, in part um, because um, there are questions of periodization um, that I think come up uh, in the dispute of when the Anthropocene begins with the golden spike um, or the nuclear signature and so on. But I think the fundamental um, generativity of the concept for me um, is was also like learned through reading environmental history, right? But it's impossible to um, extricate um, human and natural um, histories, um, but these are like imbricated and entangled from the get go, um, and they need to be thought of in those ways. And the reason that that's important is because our entire approach to whether we're doing knowledge making and knowledge production at Reed College or if we're doing policy work, we can't think of the natural and the social as separate. And I think that's just the, the way that um, climate change is actually making that more evident now. Perhaps this is why. The Anthropocene becomes a topic of conversation now and not in 1970 or 1960. Um, but I think that's kind of what, what, what the term does for me is to insist on a, or is to refuse that separation um, of the natural and human sciences that have been produced since the Enlightenment and to think more um, transdisciplinarily across, across these um, fabricated, really, right? This is, these, these, these disciplines are a consequence of human histories, not natural histories, these fabricated boundaries between the natural and the social. Thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, Eric Pisetsky, uh, class of 88, asks uh, or says, for 11 years from 1993 to 2004, I lived on a 43 Wakwes infantry. I don't know how to say that. Uh, a two-masted sailboat and a two-year trip around the Caribbean in 1999 to 2001 was never free of plastic. Any suggestions to reduce this as it is a significant risk to aquatic life? I'm going to pass that to Nikhil. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we, we um, someone, uh, Dilip Dakuna, an architect, had a chance to work with, um, describes how floods are basically made when when water crosses a line that humans have drawn. And in some ways, the issue of plastic pollution is also a, a human, like an anthropogenic um, problem, right? Um, and there's many ways and technologies that you may have like read about or, or in the news about dealing with plastics, um, that plastic pollution in the sea and microplastics as well, um, plastic gyre as well, um, of, of um, anaerobic bacteria breaking it down and so on and so forth. But actually, the, the, the best way to deal with plastics um, is, as, as um, geographer and scientist Max Baron points out, is to not produce them in the first place, right? Um, you don't produce the problems, then you're going to like, um, then deal with the ones that's caused the sea. Of course, it's not answer what to do with plastics that are already in the ocean, but I think that's a, a very generative uh, starting point for me. 
Um, I'm also gonna put in the chat Max's book, which just came out last month, um, which talks about the histories of plastics in the sea and the sciences of, of reading plastic toxicity um, once it is thrown and cast away into the oceans. And from the policy side, I'll, I'll add that there, for ex one example of sort of how in the United States at the, so in terms of ocean regulation and ocean policy, you can have point source solution where you control um, based on that point source um, and Nikhil and Jeb, who I just was doing a little bit of research and is very familiar with the CZMA. So I'm sure we'll have lots more uh, insights there. Um, you can regulate from that point source, but once it's non-point source pollution, we do have regulatory tools at the federal level to address that. Coast Guard is kind of involved, NOAA is kind of involved, um, but fundamentally when it's at the high seas, then it becomes nobody's problem and everybody's problem at the same time. Um, so within the U.S. government, the way that we've, there were, for, were two different approaches to this in the last Congress. There were two different bills. Um, there was the Break Free from Plastics Act by now no longer Senator Tom Udall, um, which was very much about sort of eroding the industrial base behind the plastics industry, which is you know, fundamentally driven by the oil and gas industry um, and their investment in promoting other uses of oil and gas and the oil and gas byproduct. Um, or there was the Save Our Seas 2.0 Act, which was a very bipartisan act that was endorsed by the American Chemical Society and was much more focused on sort of researching uh, different you know, streams to address waste, but was not necessarily concerned with reducing the base industrial base for plastic pollution in the United States. Um, I think the, the Biden administration recognized some of the harms of the plastic production industry uh, in Jeff Jefferson County or Parish in Louisiana has sort of had long been a cancer alley of its own that was bearing the brunt of all the sorts of plastic pollution. Um, and so it's fundamentally also an environmental justice issue on the production side, as much as it's also an environmental justice issue when there's the externality of pushing all of our plastic waste either on countries that will take care of it for us, um, or that will just bear the brunt of the transit of plastic across the ocean. Um, in addition to the act to then the environmental harm that we see most regularly advertised where you've got the sea turtle with a, you know, bottle ring around its neck. No cheery uh, solutions there. I'm really sorry, Eric. Rachel Fredericks, class of 2004. My apologies. I didn't get to your question. You were in the queue earlier. So I'm going to read your question now. What do you know, think about the potential economic and environmental benefits of kelp farming as a coastal management strategy? I think it's awesome. Um, you know, I, I think the so friends who work in the industry love the work that they do. A lot of people, in terms of kelp farming, people are also interested in 3D farming. So it's like three-dimensional. It's kelp, mussels, and oysters, I think. But I, I want to make sure that those two mollusks are the right mollusks, um, where you're sort of creating an ecosystem through the, the aquacultural activity that you're doing. Uh, the environmental benefits are relatively clear. They can act as a carbon sink. Uh, they can provide uh, sort of habitats in sort of more desolate areas of the sea floor. Um, I'm no expert in this by any means. I just think it's cool. On the economic side, a lot of the work that groups like GreenWave have tried to do is create a supply or a, a sale, chain of sale um, and value chain for the kelp products. So not every type of kelp that you're going to be able to grow efficiently at sea is self is that you is kelp that you necessarily want to consume. So whether or not you're using it to make dashi and types of broth, um, or whether or not you're using it as like a facial exfoliant scrub, people are trying to find different uses and the applied means for uh, selling kelp. Uh, I would encourage you if you're interested in sort of integrated farming, sustainable seafood, that sort of thing that you follow Cooking for Peace, uh, Chef Bun who runs a sushi restaurant in New Haven. Um, and he, I just went to an event he ran a couple of weekends ago where we made cicada uh, hand rolls, which was pretty, were pretty tasty. Um, but yeah, I think uh, the environmental benefits of kelp farming as a coastal management strategy are pretty cool. Um, and that the ways that we can support that on the policy side are through education and workforce development and grants to support people or loans as they take on some of the capital infrastructure costs to do some of that work. My life dream my, my, my 20 year plan is that I will become a muscle farmer. Um, I would much rather be doing that than trapped behind a desk. Um, so hopefully I can like tee that one up at some point. 
Any thoughts on kelp and peel? All right, uh, thank you, Renny. Uh, Candace Lieber, class of 1996, says, the National Park Service and the Department of Interior climate scientists have crawled out from the rock they were hiding under for the last four years and produced a document called Planning for a Changing Climate, Climate Smart Planning and Management in the National Park Service. They proposed a new framework for National Park Service Management, the RAD, Resist, Accept, Direct, the Trajectory of Change. This document is extremely broad in general, but a starting point for managers who are used to trying to preserve resources in their current state rather than accepting change. Are other agencies preparing planning documents that are similar? Big question. Um, it depends on the culture of the agency and priorities of the agency or whether or not they've been correct, uh, congressionally directed to do so. So uh, the DOD was congressionally directed to do a climate assessment. The uh, Coast Guard was not part of the DOD and so we had to direct them independently as part of DHS to do that same type of assessment. Um, for groups like the National Park Service, where they need to have these sorts of strategies in place to enable their managers to make decisions consistently, um, there's more pressure to do so. But the Park Service, um, Fish and Wildlife a little bit, there, there aren't as many um, agencies that have that much real property that necessarily have to think about it in those types of, of concrete terms, even though many agencies do have property that they use as office space, whatever. Um, so that's something that NOAA, for example, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association has been uh, thinking about a lot, what, you know, not just how do we provide data and services and education to ensure that adaptation specialists and local community organizers have the resources they need to do adaptation for, for planning for their own infrastructure, but we also have to do adaptation planning for our own facilities, but there's no mandate necessarily to do that. Um, if you track some of the congressional conversations that are having happening now, the General Services Administration is one of the government agencies that oversees federal real estate, and they're being they're currently going through a series of round and rounds of testimony around decarbonization and electrification of their buildings and climate assessments and vulnerability. And so you might see some of that in the news if anything does come of that. Um, but yeah. I'm trying to think if there are any specific agencies that I can think of who have those types of planning documents. All I can say is that my friend who is one of the heads of uh, the, national, the Fire Island National Seashore spent 10 years of his career trying to work on climate adaptation and mitigation efforts and that it's a matter of the culture and administration that you're in if you're able to move quickly on those items. Uh, Nikhil, do you have anything to say? No. Uh, so Kellen asks, uh, I'm fond of decentralized information systems, open source work, and asynchronous collaboration. Do you think that such a system could be used for, uh, sorry, used to more effectively evaluate proposed interventions to ease the backlog of projects for approval? The reason we value centralized authorities and systems is we can validate the expertise of those involved and create processes that ensure all relevant questions are addressed. But decentralized systems are faster and spread our Sorry, but decentralized systems are faster and spread out work across more people, so can be faster. Could we systematize the relevant questions for particular projects so they could be evaluated and approved more quickly? Mukil, do you have thoughts? Uh, sure, I can, I can start. Um, and I think like the, the um, question that Kevin asks is, is a good one. Um, I think one of the things that sort of um, thinking about and getting us to this project that we were doing as well is to, you know, to actually recognize what counts as information for adaptation or to broaden the, broaden the ambit of what is considered expertise beyond the usual suspects, right? Um, so, and to think more dialogically through that process. And so here, I think the promise of decentralized um, information systems is not just about um, reach, as Caleb's pointing out, um, but also in terms of what counts as knowledge and what can be brought into, and the ways in which a larger group of people can, can be brought into, participate and engage in adaptation projects um, more broadly. One of the unfortunate things I think about um, the conversations around adaptation and mitigation is oftentimes there's a whole pedagogic component attached to it, right? We need to teach you how to do resilience so that you can then go do it. But what if resilience is more broadly thought about 
as a as, as engaging with the already extant knowledge of the people that are living in and around those lines. Um, and that might be actually a more um, capacious, but also more um, it might be more easy to get people enrolled in in in, in producing um, adaptation landscapes from the knowledges and and aspirations that they have. Right, and that the uptake of the knowledge produced in those scenarios is is more there, there's there's immediate uptake of knowledge that's collectively produced um, when people feel like their voices are being represented at the table, but also that they recognize what's being said as truth and as legitimate representation of, of their work. I think Jim at the bottom of the chat mentioned that you know project backlog is more about money than permitting. Or sort of, I guess what he's referring to is sort of the. Um, the more technocratic aspects of, of permitting and getting people politically on the same page. I think it's a little bit of both. I'll note that given the given the intensity of pressure that's on the offshore wind industry right now, President Biden wants 30 gigawatts by 2030 um, the, in his president's budget, which doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to get this money. Um, he there was a plus up of, of several hundreds of millions of dollars to BOEM, to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management almost purely for full-time employees, for FTEs, right? It's about getting 30, he, they wanted 35 new people to have people to process and respond to the permit requests that are coming in to do that, types of, that type of offshore development. Um, and so that's a very concrete line of sort of trying to create that resource pipeline. Um, in terms of decentralization and, and open source work and asynchronous collaboration, Maybe the pandemic will provoke, you know, more flexibility and ease of access for people to work in the permitting sphere. Um, part of permitting is still stakeholder engagement and community engagement, and the charrettes fundamentally try to bring people together and not necessarily have conversations be isolated when you're talking to a fisherman or you're talking to a local council person or you're talking to a coastal beach user, but to get them all in the same room so that everyone can also recognize the diversity of opinions and, and interpretations of what's happening. Um, and that, that consensus building is also driving forward what happens next. Um, it's a lot that they have to do. Thank you. Uh, let's see, we've got Jim Kahan saying, I worked on a couple of water related policy projects in the 1990s and 2000s and made some use of a concept called integrated water resource management. The core eventually somewhat kicking and screaming adopted IWRM as a guiding principle. Is this still around or has it been overtaken by better concepts? I, I will go ahead, Nikhil. <laughs> um, I don't know, Jim. Uh, you probably know better than I do at this point. Um, also, hi, Jim. It's nice to, to see your voice. Um, yeah, I, I think the fundamental principles of the core, they're, they're, they're broadly distributed, right? And the core has a culture problem where there is a certain amount of entrenchment and ways of doing things. So most of what has been successful about the engineering with nature movement, which responds to principles that align with types of integrated water resource management or watershed based management um, and is informed by that science um, has been community development work. It's been trying to get people to have the same language. It's about um, shaking people out from the engineer's mindset of if this is my base flood elevation, then I have this set of options and trying to expand that menu bare minimum, if not, you know, get creative about what those activities might be. Um, so my 40,000 foot observation there is that I think that integrated water resource management is certainly a component of what's being considered. A lot of what they're working on with, with EWN, that, that new part of the Army Corps is um, sort of ecologically responsive design, water flow, habitat connectivity. A lot of these uh, principles, sort of the land-based terrestrial equivalent is embedded in the surface transportation reauthorization coming out of the house. So they're trying to think about habitat connectivity and sort of the mutual benefit to humans and animals if we don't have animals like moving across the road. The same thing is true of for at least fish species, species when they're moving across major waterways and just getting totally confused and derailed by the different types of infrastructure that are interrupting that space. Um, that's all I got. I think a little bit with the IWRM question from, from India as well. And, and you know, the concept is, 
alive and well there. It's always present and always on the edge at the same time for some decades, right, since the 1990s. Um, and I think you know, one of the reasons um, for that is, is um, Jim, what you described as well, but also what you described, is, is you know, we, we, can, we need to think about not the, the state or the government, not just as one thing, but many things, uh, many institutions having many different cultures, right? Like, and so a lot of my work, uh, my first book was thinking about the culture of the bureaucracy in the water department in Mumbai, vis-a-vis um, -vis the land department and so on and so forth. And you know, integrated water management is this is this project to like bring different um, state agencies also to the table, but state agencies are also very happy having their own tables to do their own thing, right? So I think that's kind of one of the problems um, that always pushes uh, IWRM um, to the side so that they continue doing what they really are at the time. So there is this logic of of of, of or, or how do you say these these cultures of practice. That 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 reproduce themselves uh, in very durable ways uh, over time, which is also why we oftentimes don't see transformative change um, in bureaucracies or in society. Right? We see these incremental uh, pulls and pushes um, because of these these cultures of practice and authority and and power. Uh, so Mark McLean, class of 1970, says, in some places, tide water and rivers extend uh, quite a ways inland. How might these situations be managed? By situations, he means where the use of water and wetlands is affected by sea level rise when the region is located outside the jurisdiction of authorities that address the ocean, shoreline, or estuaries. He says where he grew up, the float houses several miles inland were the low rent district. There were advantages and disadvantages to that arrangement. What do you think of this situation? <laughs> I'm sure Nikhil can think of some specific examples from his field work. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I think, like, really, I think one of the things um, is, is, you know, the 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 ways in which um, coastlines are always, um, how do you say? Urban cities, right, or or or, or water in cities, um, is always already a jurisdictional problem, right? Um, whether it's thinking about wastewater or drinking water or or waterways that extend inland, um, I think one of the things that um, the question brings to to my mind, at least, is to think about the ways in which uh, you point out, Mark, the 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 ways in which float houses are, are seen to be as um, fitting for a low rent district, right? So I want to just pick up on that to ask what are our regimes of value making? Um, and I'm thinking here both the real estate and value making, but also the ways in which we hold some practices of living more or less desirable. And how are they contributing to um, the problem? Right? So rather than go to the jurisdictional, yes, and different agencies and, and different jurisdictional um, constraints that water always escapes, which is true, I want to draw attention to the ways in which um, water, uh, watery living has also been devalued. Think of the, I mean, the uh, pejorative swamp people, right? Um, for, of, of ways in which um, we we need to like rethink and revalue um, coastlines and coastal living uh, in the Anthropocene. Uh, and I, I don't have too much to to contribute there. I think on the sort of jurisdiction question, I. I very much align with what Nikhil's saying and think that the with programs like the National Flood Insurance Program, which is administered out of FEMA, um, they they have full jurisdiction over the, sort of the implementation, as far as I'm aware. Of. I'm sure that there's collaboration with with the IRS, but of of these tax credits, right? And so it's a matter of them being directed to take certain types of action that will have direct equity and displacement implications, and they're the reason why that has not yet happened is because many members get lobbied <laughs> um, by their constituents or by developers to say, uh, no, I don't want to move. I don't want to leave. Um, or I want to be able to keep building here. And I want to ensure that I don't have a high premium. Um, this is also part of why it's taken so long to get the uh, both Army Corps and FEMA the money that they need to do comprehensive flood mapping that incorporates sea level rise and other types of climate effects. Um, is that there's 
just a, there's just a question of what the impacts are actually going to be on how people get to live and where they get to live and being told through the ind- invisible hand of tax code, um, which, you know, is a fundamental shift, I think, in the way that that I, I observe policy change happening is, is because in things like the flood insurance policy, the policy decisions being made are, are invisible. Um, they don't necessarily communicate broadly what those changes are going to do to people's lives. Um, But in the same way, in some ways, there are benefits to being invisible to policy and being invisible to the tax code um, so that you can continue to live your life the way that you want to outside of these markets that are much more controlled than I think many people realize. It's my two cents. I feel very deeply uninformed on the subject. Well, thank you. Uh, Renny and Nikhil, um, I think you know we're at our end point uh, for this session. And thank you all for your wonderful questions. And um, yeah, this has been an outstanding session. I I learned a lot. I'm so intrigued. I want to go read all of these books that you posted about Nikhil and and look at these websites. So 